Hello YouTubers, today I'll be covering Through Night's latest release, their TN36UT. Before we get into this light, it did arrive in this packaging which has changed very slightly from their previous, I guess, cookie cutter template. So previously for their mini soda can size lights, they would come in these boxes, very generic, no markings and whatnot. And that's because overall those now three models are pretty much nearly identical. So that's the Mini TN30, the TN36, and now the TN36UT. Now this updated box does feature, you know, a picture, of course, they don't show the emitter because that varies depending on the light. But it, on this side, it also does now feature the company's address and the barcode so you could get it to their website and whether it's a cool white or a neutral white model. The model that I was sent for review, as you can see here, is the cool white version. And in terms of the accessories, it did come with, this time around, a wrist strap, spare o-rings as usual, and a uh, clear cover to, that you could replace the switch with. It did, of course, also come in their standard holster, which features a Velcro loop as well as what I like to call the perma loop for a more secure hold and a nylon D-ring. I particularly like these uh, holsters because of the fact that they're completely enclosed, including the bottom. Some have a actual open bottom so that you could actually fit it through, but I like taking care of my equipment and keeping them in good shape, so thus I prefer this particular style. Now some quick facts about the TN36UT is that it now features XHP70 emitters. These are 7mm squared, one of their newest, I think part of their SC5 technology line that they call. XHP stands for extreme high power. And while being the same footprint as their previous MKR line, which the original TN36 had, these new emitters are capable of outputting much higher output. So case in point, the original TN36 pumped out, I think, 6,500 lumens. The new one features about 7,300 lumens. And that's roughly about 2,400, just a tad over 2,400 lumens per emitter here. And here's a close-up shot of the emitter. As you can see, it still has four dies, but where it's distinctly different is the fact that that gap between the dies are actually smaller as opposed to the MKRs, which you can see a close-up up here. Now, while it does also feature the same 120 degree viewing angle as the MKR, however, though, this offers a floodier profile, not necessarily in terms of overall width, but in terms of the, the beam versus the MKR version of the TN36. Aside from that, everything else is pretty much identical. It features a glass with anti-reflective coating, as you can see there. Still has the same electronic switch that you could access three main modes, output levels, and a firefly mode that is hidden, as well as a turbo and a strobe mode. Now by comparison, ostensibly it's identical to the TN36, right? The barrel is, the head is, um, like I said, other than the emitter and perhaps maybe a darker brush finished aluminum bezel there versus um, a shinier one here, it still uses the same orange peel reflector. The main difference lies in that now the TN36UT as a slightly longer base here versus the original and I assume that's because it was to accommodate that ring there for the wrist strap. Now for a light of this size I would say mm, I don't know wrist strap better than nothing but still I would have preferred attachment for a proper lanyard instead. I believe it should be reasonably sturdy enough that perhaps I guess if you got a um, key ring attachment so you could clip on a proper lanyard versus the wrist strap that they included. The innards are the same and no different than before. It still features a battery carrier, four cells in series with no spring at the bottom. That spring is actually at the head here that puts downward pressure on the battery. I actually have their 3400 milliamp cells installed. The reason why I always like to put the stickers inward facing is that the two, while not incredibly tight as previously, like say on the TN30 or TN31, I guess I've just gotten into a habit of doing that. But as you can see, there is decent clearance room without it being, you know, really difficult to put in and out. Now, in case you've missed my previous videos, as I've always liked to cover, just be a little careful with these battery carriers because these are live contact points these four posts that carry the negative path as well as the main center one which carries the positive path so that outer ring also completes the circuit as you can see there on the multimeter including these negative paths as well so something to keep in mind while the positive node is recessed still just be careful you know you don't want to be carrying this 
battery cell by itself and then accidentally short it because it is exposed on either end. So that way you can insert it this way or that way, it doesn't matter. But just be mindful that you don't short circuit that somehow. So that's the argument for using protective cells because in case you do manage to short circuit it, at least the built-in IC will, you know, cut out and that way you protect yourself. If, however, you do use unprotected cells, again, that's something to keep in mind. The battery carrier does feature these pretty decent sized springs, so it has no trouble accommodating my shorter cells, which are these AWIMRs at just a tad under 65 millimeters, as you can see there. Or my longer cells, which are these XTARS 2600s, which come in at, I think, 69.1 millimeters. They're a tight fit, but they do fit, though. Although I kind of feel like anything longer than that, and you're going to have problems with it. And just case in point that that whole battery circuit is self-contained, by just pressing and holding it against the head without the battery carrier, as you can see, doesn't need that to complete the circuit path, unlike certain lights. These threads are square cut, so it does offer very smooth action when you thread on the head. And it did come amply grease. But however though, I would always like to remind my viewers that whenever you get a light, just clean off the thread, up, apply your own grease, but do a really good job and make sure that you apply grease on the bottom of the O-ring as well. That way it prevents it from binding. And in this case, you know, it could create a lot of force on the TN series lights. As I've highlighted on the TN36 and Mini TN30 review, the switch is just a hair's width protruded. So it's a standard pressure on these electronic switches, right? So accidental activation can be a potential issue. And in this case, unfortunately, a TN36 does not feature electronic lockout, right? So like say on the TM26, if you could electronically lock out that switch by pressing and holding onto it, in this case, that was designed for turning on the Firefly mode. So you just simply need to just physically lock it out by giving it a twist. So that way you prevent it from being accidentally activated. Given does have a very nice flat base, it can be used very stably in tail standing mode or what they call the candlelight mode. Now the switch does feature a blue LED in there that will turn on in all modes except Firefly mode, which I kind of feel makes sense because in Firefly mode, you kind of pretty much want the longest runtime as possible. You don't want any additional drain, plus the fact that it doesn't create a unnecessary distraction because blue light is one of the spectrums that really impacts eye vision, especially at night, especially dark adaptive vision. So that's why I think that made a lot of sense. Furthermore, this light will turn red when the battery cells are depleted. Now, speaking of which, the total working voltage for this light is I think 10 and a half to 17 and a half volts. So thus you cannot use eight CR123 cells in here. In terms of the UI, it's no different than any of their previous TN series lights. I should say the soda can style. With the single press of the switch from off, you will turn on the last default mode. So currently it's on low. And then you press and hold to cycle through the modes of low, medium, and high. Medium, high. Now I do have this on fixed camera exposure as well as on cloudy white balance. I would say that overall the color that I'm seeing there is reasonably close to real life. If perhaps a little bit tad cooler, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more yellow in real life, but it's reasonably close. Now I feel that these three output levels are pretty well spaced, so that way there's very distinct jumps between each setting. Now in order to access turbo mode, that would be a quick double press from either when the light is on or off. So here you have it, in all its 7300 lumens glory. And likewise from off, as you can see there. Because the first press turns on the light, the second press in quick succession indicates that you want turbo mode. Now to access strobe mode, it's with the light on and then another two quick presses. This is a fixed rate strobe. Now to access the other hidden mode, which is the Firefly mode, with the light off, you would press and hold the button. And there you can see that's in Firefly mode. Only the standard output modes of low, medium, high are memorized. The Firefly, the Turbo, and the Strobe are not memorized. So case in point, I'll set this to medium. Turn the light off turn it back on, it will memorize it through battery changes as well. So you can see that's medium, back down to low. 
back up to high. Shut off the light, turn it back on, it's in high. Overall, that's pretty good because once you familiarize yourself with it, you can pretty much access any of the output level fairly easily with a single button. Again, the only thing that I wish it had is a electronic lockout switch, but again, as I have previously mentioned, not the end of the world to give it a quick twist to lock out. So if you're like most consumers, you must be thinking, well, which of these three multimeter soda can size lights should I get? Because they all are fairly similar. Each features three emitters. Got that single size switch and give or take, they're pretty much identical in size. At least the TN30 and TN36 original one are. The TN36 UT is just a tad longer because of the accommodation of that lanyard strip. Now the only reason I included the TN30 here is to give comparison for the beam profile because as mentioned, output wise, unless like I said, you really, really are in search and rescue or <laughs> you just like, you know, to do stuff for S and G, I'm gonna keep it PG. But for all intents and purposes, you just simply don't need that amount of lumens, you know, at night. I know, yes, blasphemy, this coming from a self-confessed lumens whore, but in practical terms speaking, the human eyes are really amazing. It is capable of adapting over a wide variety of light and you'd be amazed what you can see at night once it is dark adapted. Of course, no comparison to certain animals and whatnot, but the, my point is that any one of these lights would do. Say for the Mini TN30, at least these two are in the ballpark output wise. This is closer in relationship to the Mini TN30. Now again, the reason why I set the TN30 apart is the fact that this sits in a much deeper triflector, as you can see there. And because it is more recessed and it features a smaller LED emitter in the form of the XML2, this produces a much punchier throw than say any of these lights. Now out of these three specifically, Again, going by the formula that you have a small emitter in the same size reflector, you would get better throw with the Mini TN30, then consequently the MKR, and then finally the XHP70 version. Now the reason for that is you may be thinking, well, if the MKR and the XHP70 are the same die size, why is it that this is flutter beam profile? It's not necessarily that it's flutter per se, but it's rather the beam profile that it produces. So I'm gonna cut the lights out now to demonstrate that for you. All right, I've got the exposure fix and locked in at, I think, sunny white balance or cloudy white balance, but I have arranged these lights from the Throyus, which would be the original TN30 XML2 version, the Mini TN30, the original TN36, and last but not least, the TN36 UT. So starting right off the bat, I put these into comparable output levels, right? The problem with the deep triflector is, as you can see, is that there's a lot of artifacts here, as you can see, right? and you've got that pretty tight, punchy hotspot there. I'm gonna just keep that on to the side. Next we have the Mini TN30. And there you can see there is no, at least easily discernible artifacts like say on the original TN30 with that deep triflector. But that hotspot is actually much smoother versus the punchy one on the original TN30. Then you have the TN36. And here you can see, yet again, a much smoother transition in a flutter beam profile by comparison to that tighter hotspot. And last but not least, the TN36 UT in my left versus the original TN36. Now there you can see, even at close distance, the TN36 does have a punchier and tighter hotspot, whereas the TN36 UT has a much smoother one right? Especially if you look at the edge of the hotspot, it's a slightly smoother transition outwards versus the TN36. So here I have the TN36 UT on the left and the original TN36 on the right. And as you can see, overall viewing angle is roughly the same. It's about 140 degrees, but I don't know if you could make that out. I purposely stopped down the exposure, but the TN36 beam is just a tad tighter than say the TN36 UT there versus the TN36 here. And for comparison's sake, you now have the Mini TN30 on the right. As you can see, overall viewing angle not as wide, and that central hotspot is a little tighter, but can't really make that out because 
on its low level, it's only 45 lumens, so it's lower than, say, the TN36, I think, original at 117, and TN36 UVT at about 130, so. So here you have the original TN30 XML2 version, but as you can see, overall width not that wide, but heavily artifact inflicted. By comparison, here's Nyquist's TM26 with 4 emitters, but it uses four individual reflectors, so you can see it's a different beam profile overall, right? So you've got those two emitters packed tightly close together, but, like I said, in their individual reflectors, thus casting out two distinct beams at least at close distance, but it does merge into a single beam at distance. So as of the time of this review for the TN36UT, the prices MSRP on Three Nights website is $120.95 for the Mini TN30, that's US dollars. Then it's $219.95 for the TN36. And then last but not least, $252.95 for the TN36 UT. So you have the Mini TN30 here, which is priced very aggressively and offers great bang for the buck. The caveat is that it outputs 3200 levels as opposed to 6500 and 7300. But there's one thing about the Mini TN30 that these two lights don't feature, and I guess for a good reason too, is that the Mini TN30 is actually able to sustain that constant 3,500 lumens out, uh, sorry, 3,200 lumens output. Although it does also feature what Through Night calls ITC intelligent temperature control. So in case it does get too hot, it will step down. But in testing, I've seen this, you know, last pass the 10 minute barrier, still pumping out the full output. But of course the light does get extremely hot to the point where I think I measured it as something like close to 60 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, scalding hot. So you gotta be very careful about that. It does offer, like I said, the punchiest throw out of these three, whereas the TN36 is kind of like in the middle. And then last but not least, the TN36 UT, which features the most output lumens wise, but offers the least throw perceptually. If you've got a survivalist mentality and Firefly mode is of the utmost importance to you, then the Mini TN30 with 0.4 lumens can last 98 days. By comparison, this one's 1 1.6 at 33 days, likewise two lumens at 33 days. So all in all, very comparable in terms of, you know, the form factor, obviously a difference in output, as well as the feature with the sustain output on this one difference in beam and throw and of course the price so bottom line you really got to figure out what exactly do you need what what is the main purpose of this purchase if you need a light that really goes pretty good distance and still offers a floody beam profile i would suggest the mini tn30 if you want something floodier with still good decent punch the tn36 if you want just something diffuse so that way it doesn't really impact your night vision right because you've got that very tight hot spot then i would suggest the tn36 ut and that's a wrap for part one of this review. In part two, I will be covering some indoor measurements as well as lumens output measurements and current draw. So please stay tuned for that. As part of FTC disclosure, all of the products used in this video were provided by their respective manufacturer. Beginning with these reviews, I will start inputting links directly to the manufacturer's offering. Again, I don't get anything out of this, but for full disclosure, this is as a courtesy because they did sponsor the products and, you know, I can't do a lot of these reviews without sponsorship. You can help support more reviews like this by, you know, purchasing directly from the links and by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Thanks so much for watching.